If you're watching this, you probably remember buying or certainly making cassettes. If you're new to cassettes or are interested in collecting them, then this is the video for you. Hi, I'm Andrew from Parlogram Auctions. If you're a regular viewer of this channel, you might have seen the video I did last year about the first generation of Beatles cassettes issued in the UK. In this video, I'll be looking at their early solo cassettes, showing you some rare tapes and packaging, and recommending some great sounding European tapes. I'll also be taking a closer look at the sound quality of cassettes, and explain how the infamous Dolby system worked, and why switching it off can improve your listening experience. As you might have guessed, most of the music I bought back in the 70s and 80s was on vinyl, but I still have a great affection for the cassette. But for me, cassettes weren't for buying music on, they were for putting music on. I can count on the fingers of one hand how many pre-recorded tapes I've bought in my life. It was uh, just these two, actually. But I bought countless blank tapes for making mixtapes on. I've still got quite a few of them today, and listening to them brings back vivid memories of how life was for me at that time, and how I felt about the people I was with or without. Creating compilations or mixtapes was an art, a highly personal, real-time experience, and if you did one for someone else, it showed how much you really thought of them. I'm telling you all this because I've recently been drawn back into the world of cassettes through buying a huge vintage collection which included nearly 400 rare and early issues of classic and not so classic tapes. Unfortunately, I can't show you all of them here. It would be even more niche than this video. So if you're interested, I'll put some videos of me unboxing them in the channel members videos, which you can access if you wish by clicking on the join button below. Anyway, once I'd unpacked all of the cassettes, I realized that my aging Technics deck really wasn't going to do this collection justice. So I went on eBay and bought this 1985 Nakamichi BX300E for 260 euros, which is just over $300. And considering the rubbish machines produced now for more money was, I think, a good deal. It wasn't perfect though, as it had clearly had a very hard life. And like lots of things of this type you buy on eBay, which are described as being in perfect working order, this certainly wasn't. It just didn't have the strength to play the cassette at all and was all worn out and looked destined for the bin. But with the help of a YouTube repair video and a tiny 12 euro rubber idler tire from eBay, I managed to bring it back to life. Which just goes to show that with these old decks, that it's more often than not, just a simple case of replacing a small inexpensive component, like a rubber tire or a tiny plastic cog to save it from the scrap heap. Most tape decks from the 70s and 80s really are worth saving, especially because the ones which are available new today with their cheap generic Chinese made mechanisms are a complete waste of money and little more than toys. If you've seen my other video about Beatles cassettes, you'll know that all of the early EMI cassettes were manufactured by Dutch company Philips, and it wasn't until September 1970 that EMI began manufacturing their own at a specially built duplicating facility in Hayes. The first EMI made cassettes coincided with the release of the first solo Beatles albums. It's often forgotten that it was Ringo who was the first ex-Beatle to release a solo album, which was Sentimental Journey in March 1970, the first issue cassette of which is very hard to find. Paul's first solo album, McCartney, or McCartney One, as I guess it's known these days, was issued in April 1970, although this cassette didn't hit the shops until a few months later. This is a first issue of that album on cassette, which has a white card insert and generously lists other Beatles and related cassettes inside. The cassette itself has a yellow paper label and still uses a Philips three-windowed shell. By contrast, this 1972 copy has the new metallic gold cover with EMI's own single window black shell. It still has a printed yellow paper label, but the shell is now EMI's own black single window design. Like the Beatles cassettes before them, 
the track order here was shuffled to make sure each side matched as closely as possible time-wise, so no tape was wasted. So despite starting and ending with the same songs as the vinyl, the only other track which matched that running order was Man We Was Lonely and Ooh You. Ringo was a busy man in 1970, for no sooner had Paul released his first solo album, Ringo put out his second in the space of six months, which was Bocoops of Blues. Again, like most of these early cassettes, it's a tough one to find, and it too advertised the latest Beatles albums, which had just been issued on cassette for the first time. November 1970 saw the release of George's triple album, All Things Must Pass, which according to this 1971 EMI catalogue was priced at £5.50, pence, which inflation adjusted works out at a ridiculous £85, or $120 today. As double cassette cases hadn't yet been invented, it was issued in two separate cases, which were housed inside a thin card slipcase, of which very few survive. First issue tapes used this full bleed design on their inlays. This was later replaced by the generic gold top design. Unlike the other EMI cassettes we've seen so far, these tapes followed the running order of the vinyl set, with the Apple Jam disc taking up all of side two of the second cassette. The first Lennon solo album, Plastic Ono Band, followed that December, and it too is very hard to find in its original cassette form. It would have been nice to see a cassette in the format options of the forthcoming reissue of this album, especially as Paul did one for his recent McCartney 3 album. At the beginning of 1971, EMI, in an effort to increase sales of cassettes and their presence in stores, decided to try out some different packaging ideas. First was this experimental cigarette packet design, as shown here on Steppenwolf's Gold from March 1971. In fact, Philips, the company who invented the cassette, launched it at an electronics fair in 1963 with the slogan, smaller than a packet of cigarettes. The White Album was issued like this too when it was first released on cassette in August 1971, and like All Things Must Pass, cost five pounds as well. But like cigarette packets themselves, they weren't robust enough to withstand constant use and were quickly abandoned making them one of the holy grails of Beatles cassette collecting today. Another idea involved incorporating the cassette into a large backing card, rather like the long boxes CDs first came in. This example is a reissue of an album by The Seekers on the EMI-owned World Records label of their 1964 album Hide and Seekers. This design was also tried out for the White Album, as well as Lennon's Imagine album in late 1971, both of which are impossible to find today. EMI eventually abandoned trying to find different packaging designs and reverted to the regular Norelco plastic case, which went on to be the packaging of choice for the next 20 years. However, the cigarette packet design did make a brief return to the shelves in the early 1980s for the short-lived cassette single format. The Beatles themselves also had a brush with the cassette single format in 1987 with All You Need Is Love, which was issued to coincide with its 20th anniversary. But as in the 1982 singles box, it used a fold down of the stereo mix rather than the original mono single mix. No more cassette singles were issued by the Beatles until August 1991, when they all came out at once. Throughout the rest of the 1970s, the Beatles and solo cassettes, along with other EMI label artists, were housed in these attractive dusty gold top covers, which by the early 1980s had degraded into a sort of hearing aid beige colour, before being replaced by a cleaner design for the final XDR series in 1987. One of the cassettes I didn't feature in the previous video, and got a lot of comments about not doing so, was this. It's called Only the Beatles, a pretty unattractive looking tape with a title which sounds like a rejected idea for With the Beatles. It was a cassette only compilation released in July 1986 in conjunction with Heineken beer. To get a copy, you had to get four pull tabs, remember them, from specially marked cans of Heineken and send them along with a cheque or postal order for £2.99. 
It's easy to forget that unlike today, where rare Beatles material like outtakes and rare mixes are officially available everywhere, that they were pretty thin on the ground in the 1980s. As under their agreement with Apple, EMI were technically not allowed to issue any unreleased material. Even the news of one or two rare stereo mixes was enough to send the Beatles collecting world into a frenzy. So understandably, this tape was very popular with collectors at the time. But it was yet another case of the hype not living up to the reality. And there was in truth very little to get excited about. Side One kicked off promisingly with the original Ringo on drums version of Love Me Do. But things went downhill quickly when the promised true stereo version of This Boy turned out to be the same reprocessed mess which had been included on the bonus EP in the EP collection box set four years earlier. And although Side 2 had the then unreleased true stereo version of Yes It Is, it was overall a big disappointment. It's not a great sounding cassette either. Things were made worse when just over two weeks into the promotional, Apple appeared waving legal papers and ordered EMI to stop distribution. This of course raised its credibility and turned it into a desirable, if rather low grade collectible. As we've seen in past videos on this channel, the Germans knew how to make decent sounding vinyl and the cassettes were pretty good too. For example, these two eclectic and unique German record club compilation cassettes contain some superb sounding stereo mixes and are well worth tracking down. Also, these 1980s stereo editions of Please Please Me and A Hard Day's Night are the best I've ever heard on cassette. Although oddly, this German edition lists the UK cassette running order on the inlay, but the tape plays the correct vinyl order. Anyway, you really can't go wrong with German cassettes. They all sound great. To illustrate that fact, take a look at this waveform of I Should Have Known Better, which I recorded from these 1980s UK German and stereo cassettes. As you can see, there's plenty of strong dynamics going on on the German tape. And when I switch to the spectral analysis, there's lots of strong sound information in the high end range. Switching to the recording of the UK cassette, you can see that it's much weaker in that high end range. And there's even a sharp high end cutoff at around 16K or 16,000 Hertz. But ultimately, it's all academic at that end of the spectrum because most people over 40 will struggle to hear anything over 15K anyway. Talking of high frequencies, it's not only hearing loss from aging which can reduce them. There was a special feature on your cassette deck to do that too. And that was the infamous Dolby noise reduction system. The first Dolby treated tape with a Beatles connection was John's Mind Games in November 1973, seen here in its rarer eight track format. Beatles music had to wait until June 1976 before it received the Dolby treatment on their double play rock and roll music tape. But how exactly does Dolby work? When an album is mastered in the recording studio, the high frequency signals on the tape are boosted according to a preset Dolby standard. When the same tape is played back on Dolby equipment, the Dolby system reverses those boosted frequencies in exactly the same way, therefore reducing the high frequencies, i.e. tape noise. But the high frequencies of the music are not affected and are reproduced as originally recorded along with a slightly compressed sound. Dolby B was the standard cassette noise reduction system in the 1970s and most of the 1980s, after which it was joined by Dolby C and Dolby S. Although the instructions inside the cassettes suggested you should play a Dolby encoded tape with the Dolby switched on, that usually had the undesired effect of making the music sound dull. I always made recordings on cassette with the Dolby switched on, but switched it off for playback. To me, that gave the music a kind of ethereal wall of sound, especially when it had been recorded on a good quality chrome tape, which is the sound you just don't get on vinyl. Unlike in the 70s and 80s, we're now more tolerant of a bit of gently falling rain tape hiss. Indeed, rather than detracting from the listening experience, it's now held up as a marker of a recording's authenticity. Like most decks of this quality, this machine had the option of Dolby C, but in addition to modifying the high frequencies like Dolby B did, Dolby C interferes a little with the mid-range frequencies 
and for me, alters the sound a bit too much when played back with Dolby Nothing. So now, as some people have asked me to stop talking and play some music, let's do that with a Dolby audio demonstration. Unfortunately, not with a Beatles song. Instead, I'll use this video's theme music, which is a safe, royalty-free track. I've recorded the track from my computer onto this Type 2 Sony CD-A90 cassette on the Nakamichi with the Dolby B switched on. I'll play it back on that same machine, first with the Dolby switched on, and then with it switched off. Hopefully, if YouTube's sound compression doesn't ruin it, you'll hear the difference, especially if you're listening to this through headphones. So here we go. This is with Dolby B switched on. And here it is again with Dolby switched off. Did you hear the difference? If you did, let me know your impressions in the comments. Generally speaking, pre-recorded cassettes like these early EMI ones we looked at earlier sound fairly flat and dull when played back on modern equipment, and they are nowhere near the quality of the vinyl. They also tend to be oversaturated and sound quite unpleasant and distorted in places. The later tapes sound much better. The best sounding cassettes I've heard are the late 70s, early 80s German and Dutch ones. Collecting cassettes is inexpensive and rewarding, and they're still relatively easy to find. Even if you, like me, didn't like them in the first place, it's always interesting to hear Beatles music in a different way, and some really do sound great. So why not take the plunge and get hold of a decent second-hand cassette player and have some fun? because after all, that's what collecting is all about. As always, I hope you found this video interesting and that you'll subscribe for the many more which are in the works. Also, do consider becoming a channel member, which would really help me to continue to make these videos for you. We're around on Facebook, Instagram and eBay, as well as our website, parlogramauctions.com. Finally, I'd like to dedicate this video to Dutchman Lou Ottens, who passed away on March the 6th, 2021. Like many of his generation who created great things, Ottens never became a household name, but he was the man at Philips who invented the compact cassette. And when asked what he thought of the recent cassette revival, said, quote, nothing could beat the sound of a CD. Thanks for watching.